Hello everyone, um, I'm Dan Pinchbeck, I'm the creative director of The Chinese Room and this is the Dear Esther developer's commentary. Hi, I'm Rob Briscoe, I'm the artist on Dear Esther. And I'm Jessica Curry and I was the composer on the game. So what you're looking at today is a remake of a remake of a mod. Um, Dear Esther started off in 2007 as a Half-Life 2 mod um, that did really, really well in the modding community, which was fantastic, and as a result of that, attracted the attention of Rob, who worked as the primary developer on a Source remake of the game that was released in 2012. And this year is another remake where the, it's been updated for a cross-platform release, and we wanted to add in this developer's commentary just to give you a bit more of an insight into some of the ideas behind the game as it came together. When I wrote the music for the mod of Dear Esther, there was absolutely no budget whatsoever for uh, live players, so all the music was sampled. But one of the good things about that is it actually forced me to be quite creative about how I wrote the music. So with my background in sound art, I wanted to use samples in a different way that wasn't just um, using it to sound like a violin. I wanted to time stretch and manipulate samples to make something different and strange and quite unique. Um, but then... So people have asked why the um, Dear Esther's set on a Hebridean island. What's really interesting about this is one of those times when your kind of aspirations as an artist and the practical realities kind of dovetail. We knew that we had to have some way of limiting the player from disappearing off the play space. And when we made the original, it was a mod, and because it was a Half-Life 2 mod, you kind of had Eastern European city, spaceship, or blasted, desolate landscape were your three options if you didn't want to start making any other assets. So it started off with these practical constraints that we don't want to set it on a space. One of the things you're always trying to do as a composer is create memorable themes. And uh, a slight confession is that the, probably the most memorable theme, which is uh, Remember in Dear Esther, wasn't actually created for the game. Um, <laughs> Rob's I'm looking shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually from um, a piece of choral music that I'd written years uh, before, uh, based on a Christina Rossetti poem called Remember. And one of the things I was talking about earlier was how I didn't have any budget. So I had this piece of choral music and I thought, hang on, this is absolutely perfect for Esther, but I don't want to use all of it. So the only bit that you actually get in the game is the first line of the choral piece of music. But that actually went on to form the main theme of the music that I wrote. And I think for me it's really interesting about how things that you've written earlier, years before, sometimes come in really, really useful and fit. So I always tell people and students not to despair if something doesn't get used or doesn't work at the time, because actually there'll come a place or in a time where you think, hang on a minute, I've got something that fits. So in terms of that memorable theme, the remember theme gets used in multi multitude of different ways. White lines. Yeah. They actually did this. It was really cool, I found this historical document. They used to do this on Bora and the Hebrides. If their disease broke out, really? they'd actually chip out and expose the chalk. I so if you're know. on a boat and you were coming to the island, you'd know not to land because it was infectious, That's which is the coolest, most amazing. It's one of those things where you go, it's almost impossible as a writer to come up with something as cool as that. It just has to be something that was actually done. And it's so sad as well. And I love this bit and the fact that we can do it because it, it feels really real because it references a real thing. And I know there's something really special about that, but it was always one of those bits in the game that I thought, we've got to be able to represent this somehow. We have to be able to get these things in here. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I actually didn't know that was actually based historically in, in real life, but that's, that's really cool. Because, I, I mean, I, I, my thing about the white lines is that it, is, it was kind of, it was this completely surreal thing, but also it was kind of, 
it, it just added to the landscape. It was like, whoa, what the hell is that? Um, um, and putting that into the game was was kind of challenging because to me it just seemed like, oh, this is it's going to be really hard to pull off uh, in a way that's kind of realistic. But then when you look at the the kind of art style of the game, it's not really a realistic thing. Like everything is is uh, half imagined. So you've in that way, it kind of really fit into the landscape. Something that I wanted to bring through in the art of the game was was the same kind of fidelity that you find in the both Jessica's music and Dan's writing. Uh, in the same kind of way that you have all of these little details, these very uh, close attentions to detail that that kind of really bring richness to the story and something that was missing in the original mod version was just this lack of, of, of a visual layer of story um, and something that I did uh, throughout the the art of the game is to add in all these little details here and there little bits of story little links to certain things that you may or may not hear or see um, just a, a layer of richness in the world and give you some kind of reward for exploring so keep your eye out as you look around. There's a scene in Donnie Darko where Drew Barrymore's playing uh, his English teacher and she talks about cellador as being the most beautiful word in the English language and about it's the sound of the words together. And Dear Esther actually comes from the introduction to From a Faith No More song, the Crab song on the first album, Introduce Yourself. And there's a point where... Um, I think it's Chuck at that point as the vocalist before Mike Patton just says, Dear Esther. And it really lodged with me because the sound, Dear Esther, just has a, a really amazing sound to it. And I think when we started making it and the idea of it being this series of letters to someone came through, it just came straight back out of going, that's just a really beautiful sounding combination of words. And I think that really sums up the whole approach to the writing in Dear Esther of what's a really, what's the most beautiful combination of words and images we can put together and to do it that way rather than writing a traditional plot as such. So yeah, Dear Esther, Faith No More and Doom, that's where it comes from. One of the things that's been most commented on with the audio and the music in Dear Esther is how sparse it is. And that was a really deliberate tactic. I wanted to leave room for the player to think and to dream and to wonder and to put their own interpretation into what was happening. And I think the problem with so much modern media is how bombarded we are constantly. It's the kind of MTV, flash in your face, constant music. And Dan and I watch a lot of drama together and there really is constant endless, music. Which is constantly telling you what you should feel, like really clearly. And it's like being kind of beaten up by the music sometimes. And when you read a lot of reviews of Dear Esther, a lot of people say they had this time to think and to interpret, and that was one of their favourite things, that they place themselves so directly into the game, and it's their experience, and I think that's actually the greatest success of the game on all points, from the story to Rob's art to the music, is we all left space for the player to dream. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, places in the game where you see a lot of strange things and uh, this is very deliberate um, One of the things we wanted to do is just kind of like not spoon feed the player um, Every little piece of story we kind of just some things are literally just in there to to just kind of Let you think and let you decide on whatever you want to uh, bring to the story yourself um, but so there's it's kind of like a, I, I approached it like a, an impressionist painting where you've got like this kind of very vague outline of things. Uh, but if you stare at it enough, you can kind of like fill in the spaces uh, and kind of the image comes together on its own. So a lot of these kind of strange uh, uh, pieces of geography and stuff, that, that's, that's, that's really kind of deliberate in some ways just to kind of uh, 
uh, keep keep the player's mind open and, and kind of bring their own interpretations of the story through that. When I was originally thinking about how to write the music for the game, I suddenly realised that you don't see anybody in the game and the most important character as such is the island itself. So one of the things that I did with the music was to write the island as if she or he were a character in its own right. And that's really important, I think, that you're going through this space and actually it's completely devoid of people, but the music in a way populates mm -hmm. the island and that the voice of the island speaks to you through the music. Which is interesting because I think that's really come on in terms of later games we've done that that sowed the seeds for the way in which we approach music in Rapture where it was very specifically the voice of characters. A machine for pigs as well where the music was about being Lily's voice in the game, Lily's representation in the game. So it's interesting how, looking back on Esther, a lot of those kind of ideas were, were tried out here that then came on to take other forms in stuff we've done since. All right, let's talk about walking. Let's do it. We're going we're gonna to address the elephant in the room, the very, very slow-moving elephant in the room. So this might be a longer um, conversation because uh, it kind of fits with that. So Esther was the first of the, the what are now called walking simulators, um, and it was really interesting that, that for us it didn't feel that weird to have a game that was slower than normal, where actually there was lots of time to just walk around and think and look at things. And it was amazing at the time how this was seen as completely revolutionary. And um, it's really interesting. And it's amazing to see how many other games have kind of like taken it on board. For me, it was, it came from, I didn't see it as being odd to have a game where very little happened where you thought about what you were doing. Um, for me, it was kind of interesting that you could play some of the best moments in Doom are the bits where nothing's happening and you're just doing it, or, or System Shock, or those games that I absolutely love. Those quiet moments were the really, um, the really powerful ones. But Esther is definitely slower than a lot of games. And I think that's actually why it's lasted. I think if we'd have, we did have moments where we went, should it be faster, should we put a sprint button in? But I'm so pleased that we kind of held our nerve and went, no, just as like in real life, I don't run everywhere because that would be weird. It's okay to have a game where you don't run everywhere. And actually it is a bit weird to run everywhere. But if you're gonna do that, then you've got to support it in other ways. And I think the music was a really powerful way of supporting that change of pace. What's really funny for me though, Dan, is that shamefully I'd never played a game before I worked on Dear Esther. So I didn't realise that all games weren't like this, which is now <laughs> looking back really naive. But I didn't realise that games didn't have, you know, always have, you know, this slow pace. And I thought there were lots of meditative games out there and that, actually wasn't really the case at the time and that's exploded since um, but in terms of the music supporting that pace that you'd set emotionally felt really important so if you listen to the music actually the BPM is it, it is at a very slow walking speed and it just almost, I mean, there's a lot of things now that say it's called entrainment, that it slows your heartbeat, or it can speed up your heartbeat when you listen to music. And actually, I think what the Esther music does really successfully is it makes you almost accept, and more than accept, that, that speed, you actually start to feel that that's the pace of your journey. And that I really like that about the music, actually. Um, it just, yeah, it makes you just comfortable with that pace too. It, I think it just eases you into it. You feel Thank relaxed. You. The radio mast in Dear Esther is obviously, there is a really important um, kind of design feature as well as its, its place within the story. And that I think came from, it was really interesting it being a Half-Life mod to begin with and the Citadel in Half-Life 2, that it tells you how far you are through the game. You're always looking up to the skyline, am I closer to the Citadel, can I see it? And it lets you know how near you are to the end of the game. And it was really important because Esther's so open in a way and because there isn't this, you're not using 
kind of shootouts or kind of gating it with, with combat encounters to kind of constantly keep you moving, that it was really, really important that you always had that focal point of going, I know exactly from the beginning of the game, virtually right from the start, you know where you're going, you know where the game's going to end up, and you know that sooner or later you're going to be either at the base of that thing or climbing that thing, and it's always there, that red light. And I think particularly with the colour palette of the game, the fact that you've got this very, very, very clear red light that's unlike any of the other colours in the game immediately tells you as a player, this is what the shape of this thing is going to be, this is where I'm going, this gives me a purpose, even if the sort of moment by moment is a bit more abstract. Yeah, and navigationally as well, it helps you, it, 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 it draws you in the right direction as you play the game. You can never get lost if you just follow that one uh, landmark. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting place of where that sort of traditional game design is still, there's loads of it in Esther, yeah, it's yeah. just not necessarily done in quite the same way. So something you'll notice as you look around the environment is, uh, you know, from a distance you see the landscape, it's kind of a beautiful place in some, in some ways. Um, but <clears throat> something I wanted to bring to the, to the game is that there's this second layer beneath uh, the surface, whereas if you look at things closely, you see that the actual island itself is very polluted, it's kind of uh, very uh, rotten. Uh, it, you know, everywhere you look, every rock, every, every grass surface, it has this layer of filth on it. And it's kind of been put in there just to kind of emphasize further that this island is a really unpleasant place to live. It's like if you scratch the surface, you see like just how corrupt this island is. We cast and did all the voice direction for Esther ourselves for the mod, and it was basically uh, Jess and I on um, a casting website, just listening to people's show reels and finding what's the voice of this thing. And it was. There was never any question about Nigel. I think we heard his showreel for the first time around. It's probably been listened to sort of 30 or 40 actors. And we started listening to his showreel and just both looked at each other and went, that's it, that's him. And it was amazing when, when Nigel came in, we had, I think, a day and a half to do the whole thing. And he just did that amazing thing that really, really great actors did. If he just walked in, got in front of the microphone and more or less did the entire thing in one take. And we did hardly any retakes on anything. It just felt like his instinct for the character in the game was so strong that he just, without virtually any direction, just came in and just got it. And one of the hardest things with the voiceover that we did was when we went from the mod, which had three potential narrative units per queue, to four potential narrative units per queue, was not only finding new bits of writing that kind of complemented and played off what was there in the original mod, but for Nigel to come back in, what, nearly five years later, and to just re-find that voice in exactly the same way and deliver it in a way that fitted in and complemented it was a real testament to his ability as an actor, I think that apart from the, we had spent quite a lot of time trying to make the, the sound actually sound the same in terms of mic placement and things like that, but in terms of the actual delivery of those new monologues, you wouldn't know that that was both written and acted sort of four and a half years after the original thing was done. So the one person who's not in the room sort of today but deserves a So this hole in the ground was kind of a, a difficult thing in some ways. It's a bit of a challenging aspect of the game because yeah. uh, in in some ways it kind of like I think for me we we wanted to have this this kind of this this pit here and we, I, I wanted to play it to be able to actually go as close as possible and like look over the edge and and, and you know kind of have this feeling of, of dread and stuff but the other issue that we faced was like what happens if the player just jumps into the hole like yeah. we, we have no real death in the game and uh, from a design point of view, Dan, I mean, I don't know what you... you it was really hard because, yeah. you know, it was a, a game where we, we couldn't let the player die. We didn't want to have respawns, but we had to handle the fact that there would be both accidents where the player would, would fall off a cliff or something, but also the deliberate urges of the player. Yeah. You know, the first thing you're going to do is go, great, there's an ocean, how far out can I go? Or yeah. there's a cliff that's really high, can I jump off it? And how do you have death in a game where you can't have the player die? Because if the player starts breaking up the experience by dying and reloading, then you're in a really, you start breaking the experience a lot. So, yeah, I mean, we, did, I, we didn't want to also have like artificial boundaries, you know, where yeah. it's like an invisible wall 
Um, like if you if you take a look through the game, you'll never see a place where you think you can get to, but you can't. There's always some kind of actual natural boundary or uh, man-made boundary. So yeah, that was that was the other thing. We didn't really want to create this invisible wall around this thing. So it kind of the whole drove the the way in which that sort of the the very weird audio visual probably one of the most dreamlike bits in the game where if you do die and you get the kind of the the heartbeat and the um, the strange flashes of visuals and they, I think in a lot of ways if we hadn't had the hole there and we hadn't had a, a place where we go right players will jump in this hole we have to start from that basis they will throw themselves down this hole it kind of gave us the impetus to really really focus on it and I think the stuff like the drowning deaths and the cliff deaths are strong because the hole was there and I'm not sure if the hole hadn't been there yeah. whether or not we'd have arrived at those that way of handling it which I'm I'm really proud of I think it's a really incredibly creative interesting way of handling a player going out of bounds and, and of actually being able to reset the game when the player's basically done something you ideally wouldn't want them to do yeah, and I, I kind of think it fits well with the theme of the game as well because you don't really know what's just happened. Yeah, it's not absolutely. Like, it's not like you you hear a death sound and then you kind of respawn. It's this kind of like very soft, uh, very ambiguous change. You yeah. Know? There was a point in the original mod where if you died, it would do the whole Half-Life major yeah. fracture detected. Yeah. It's always <laughs> read a really good tone to the game. Yeah, yeah. Come back. One of the really important jobs of a composer, I think, is to provide the player or the listener with different emotional tones and states. And up until this point in the game, the music has been very sparse, very intimate, and very isolating in a way. But the island is also a beautiful and magnificent place and what I wanted to do at this point for the first time in the game is to create something that was really epic. So we go from that shift in scale where it's very intimate and small to suddenly realising that this is an extraordinary and magical place to be as well as a difficult and uh, quite sad and uh, melancholic place to be. So the string players were instructed at this point and to play with much more vibrato. Um, up until this point, they've played in a very sort of Scottish style, actually, no vibrato, very plain playing. But this was a really beautiful cue to write, actually, because it that has that scale. You suddenly realise that the island is really big and, um, it, it, you know, you have this beautiful vista and the music then shifts so the player can actually, just for a moment, I think, enjoy being where they are. Yes. I think that's it. Can I? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is actually one of my favourite parts of the, of the game. It's just where everything, all the elements kind of come together perfectly. You've got the, the, the music, which just is just epic, as Jess has said. You've got the landscape, which is kind of like this big open space. Um, you've got all the little uh, bits and pieces that I put into the detail detail of the environment, like the movement, there's leaves blowing around, there's the clouds in the sky, uh, there's the, the mist rising off of the uh, of the grass, and then you've got Dan's voiceover uh, coming in there. And I think it's it's just like all of these elements coming together and just in perfect synergy and just, just kind of, it really brings, uh, you know, chills up your spine. <laughs> 